All right, we will start in one minute. One minute American. <laughs> Not a metric minute, but a U.S. minute, okay? Yeah, yeah. You got 30 seconds. Perfect timing. Perfect. You got it. All right. Welcome, everyone, for our work session for March. Uh, this. All right, so uh, for under presentations, we're, we're doing a retirement plaque for Rick Gillian uh, of 29 years with the city on Thursday. And a presentation, the proclamation of the month of March is Women's History Month. Uh, actually, that's the official day is tomorrow, not that the, in the whole month, but we will present this to the city on Thursday. Also, under department reports, uh, I'd like to have the county council consider uh, having an, a report recurring update on the downtown for a project once a month. Is uh, that something the council would like to have? All right, I don't think we need, need a vote, but you will take care of that, correct? Thank you very much. <laughs> yep, yep, what is the first one on Thursday, which uh, a lot of things have happened, a lot of good things. Item uh, number one, under public hearing, conduct a public hearing pursuant of NC General Statute 158.7-1. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Calling Brad to present this item to council. Mr. Payne, Ms. Klachinski, and Ms. Deason. Uh, this agenda item is called Project Rock. The applicant is HSREI LLC, which is Hendrick. Uh, the project location is 7301 Hendrick Auto Plaza Northwest. And it sits on approximately 30 acres adjacent to the Hendrick Motorsports Campus on one side and the Kia and Volkswagen dealerships running along Bruton Smith Boulevard on the other side. The project proposal is to develop a 269,500 square foot advanced manufacturing center, which we refer to as AMC, to attract a premier top tier state of the art advanced manufacturing tenant bringing you know, high quality jobs and careers to Concord for the foreseeable future. Uh, this will be the second building to be built on the Hendrix Manufacturing Campus. Uh, the first building was the Hendrix Motorsports Manufacturing Building that Council considered in January. Project request is a one year, 85% economic development industrial spec grant. Estimated investment is $23,700,000. The estimated grant amount would be $96,696, and the estimated net tax to the city would be $17,064. Anyone more happy to answer any questions that council might have. All right, thank you, Brad. Uh, council have any questions? All right, thank you very much. Item number two, conduct a public hearing, consider adopting an ordinance amending Article, ta article 8, Table 8.1.8, .8, Use Table. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Call on Kevin to come forward, give the staff report to council on this item. Afternoon, Mayor, members of council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kolchinski. This item, uh, in spite of the long title, it's, it's essentially the, the, the tiny home amendment. There's a small multifamily setback change also that, uh, that will go with, uh, I'll go over at the end to sort of make things, make a little more sense. Um, as you know, we have, and I'm sure you have, been receiving a, a lot of inquiries about the development of smaller houses on smaller lots or a set of smaller homes on one parcel. Um, in theory, you could have a tiny home now, but it would be on a standard building lot. If you have a 10,000 square foot lot over in Glendale that's vacant, you could put the smaller home on that lot. You could just put one of them there, and as long as it meets building code. And, and this amendment would allow um, a higher density with, with a tiny home product. Um, they're obviously an attractive option for single people and empty nesters. Um, we've, we've taken a look at ordinances from other jurisdictions uh, within the state. We've drafted some standards based on the parts of those principles and those ordinances that we think work really well. We selected several parcels within the city 
um, and prepared rudimentary designs to make sure that those requirements could be met. And when I mean rudimentary, I mean very rough um, blocks of paper signifying the, the, the building size on those lots, um, so on and so forth. Uh, we, we contacted a local architect that has tiny home and infill design experience. Um, they reviewed and provided feedback on our requirements. We amended those accordingly. So we've at least had a professional look at the first draft of the ordinance. So just to show you some examples of uh, real world tiny homes, uh, floor plan on the left and a couple of uh, photographs on the right. Um, Here's a couple of real-world examples from Atlanta of, of, of tiny homes. Um, I think the one on the right is 600 square feet. The one on the left is 300. And that has the, the, the floor plan on the right is for the larger unit. Um, and th this is also from that same development, as you see, see they're selling for 210000 If you look at the tiny home on the left, that one, in, in the background, you can actually see single-family homes uh, built to the, uh, to the right and to the back of, of, of those units. Um, here's a couple more photographs of some real-world tiny homes. And with their development, we've added another level of smaller homes called cottage homes. Some ordinances call them pocket homes. Some call them bungalow homes. Some places call them cottage courts. When we've had inquiries about these, the developers call them cottages. So that's why we went with the nomenclature of cottage homes. Um, and they're typically units clustered around a courtyard. They're larger than tiny homes. They're not, a, they're not as small. They're, they're not as large as the traditional single family home. 2,000 square feet and up than the people are building in our jurisdiction right now. Uh, here's a couple of other examples. The, the, the site plan to the left shows uh, six units in a, in a parking area in the back, a couple of photos. So getting down to the nitty gritty, the basics of what we have come up with, again, two levels of smaller homes, a tiny home, which would be a maximum of 600 square feet on a permanent foundation. Some jurisdictions allow movable tiny homes. Um, most do not. The ones that would be on wheels would essentially be RVs. We have separate regulations for an RV park. Most people have set, it seems most jurisdictions have settled on that permanent foundation for a tiny home. And it has to meet building code. Uh, next level up would be the cottage home, which is a maximum of 1,500 square feet. Um, the cottage home product, we've had several developments within the past couple of years that have come in that have wanted to do something similar. We, we've um, steered them toward the T and D infill, which doesn't always work well for that, but this would be a nice middle ground between a tiny home and the next level up of regular single family development. So the way we have everything set up, tiny homes would be permissible only in RV, residential village or residential compact and staff approvals with these set of standards that we've, we've drawn up. A tiny home development would be at the minimum four dwelling units at the maximum 15. Fo uh, talked to one developer, he said, well, well, why do you have a maximum cap on the number of units? And we're thinking we want to steer them more toward infill development as opposed to raw land being taken up for large tiny home developments. And then it's always easier to, to take a conservative approach with the ordinance and then maybe loosen it up a little further down the line when we see if things are going to work. And you know, until we get one or two of these, we're, we're sort of grasping at straws to see if all this will work. We're, we're pretty sure it will. Um, so the projects the individual homes could either be subdivided for sale or allowed on one overall parcel. So that's, that's the option with what we're proposing. The overall parcel size, which um, I would call the parent tract, would have to have at least 50 feet of street frontage on a public street. Um, the tiny home lots would, the, the tiny home parent parcel would be 10,000 square feet minimum, two, two, two acre maximum. Cottage homes, 15,000 square foot minimum, two acres maximum. If, if uh, the developer were to subdivide the lot, the tiny homes, of course, no minimum lot size, 4,000 square foot maximum. Cottage homes, no minimum lot size, 5,000 square foot maximum. And the reason we're setting maximum lot sizes is to ensure that there's plenty of common open space in all these developments. Density, um, we're proposing 125% of the district maximum 
So that would equate to 10 dwelling units an acre in RV and 18 in RC. That's not a terribly large increase. We've seen a lot of uh, um, jurisdictions that, that actually have no maximum density. They work on a series of formulas to allow how many units you can put on, put on the uh, parcel, but we think, we think this will work well with the um, decrease in the building size the increase in the density would, should, should be offset with the smaller homes. Open space and buffers, we are proposing 30%. Yes, sir. Are you, is this what you're proposing or is this what we have now? This is what we're, this is what we're proposing. This is what we're proposing. We have, we have none of this in the, in, in the ordinance right now. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Oh, sorry for the confusion, sir. Okay, so with open space and buffers, we're proposing 30% of the overall parent tract to be open space, 350 square feet per unit required. Those would be cross checks against each other. Common areas and site improvements um, would be designed for the benefit of the community. There would have to be a, a square or some type, of, uh, some type of community gathering area. A type A buffer around the perimeter would be planted in common open space. Uh, setbacks 10 feet from a public street or five from a front property line off the public street or from the common area if not subdivided. Interior setbacks would be five feet if it's subdivided or 10 feet between units. So you always have that constant of 10 feet separation between all the units. So other requirements, the access to the tiny homes would be from a private drive which connects to a public street. So each, each one of the tiny homes would not have a driveway onto a public street. It would be a a shared driveway, parking at the rate of two spaces per unit, and that could be put within a common area. Uh, you could have an amenity structure within the common area, and there would be a required pedestrian network connecting to the public sidewalk. Um, there would have to be adequate space at the public street for garbage and recycling pickup, and low impact development measures would be encouraged for stormwater control. So here's, a, here's an example of an actual tiny home site plan, which um, from another jurisdiction, which could be implemented here in Concord. It's, uh, you have four units, uh, about 400 square feet in each one of the, uh, each one of the units. Uh, one common driveway coming in off of a public street with eight parking spaces. You have a buffer around the outside and you see a communal fire pit on the interior that would be the common space. So again, this is one that's actually going in for construction at this point. And you see, it's a pretty good example of infill development. You've got a power line easement going through. It, it bisects it. They're keeping the, keeping the units out of that. And it's a, good, it's a good use of the property. It's, one, it's 150 by 150, which, which you know, makes it a lot easier when you've got a square lot, you know, knowing that not all the lots particularly in our city, or square. So there's a uh, companion um, tweak we want to do to 7.8.2. So we've had a lot of multifamily developers ask us if, if they could build single-story multifamily units within an apartment project. The answer is yes. The problem is our spacing requirements in multifamily is 20 feet between structures, whether they're single family or multifamily. Um, and it, it's, it's actually killed a couple of pretty, pretty good projects that we've, we've had come in. So we thought it might be a good idea to amend that spacing of 20 feet to 10 feet if they're single story structures. And that coincides with that tiny home and cottage home requirement setbacks. We're looking at 10 feet between all of these units, and that makes it consistent, whether it's a rental project, a subdivided project, so on and so forth. And so also, as part of this tweak, we're clarifying that the multifamily requirements are applicable to developments of four or more. All of the other places, th this part of the code actually had five or more. Every other place in the code says multifamily is applicable to four or more. So we're just essentially correcting an error in, in the multifamily design standards. So, yes, yes sir. You're saying single story, four unit structure. 
sing, single story multifamily structures. Um, not necessarily. Uh, they would be they would be single story one and two dwellings. Yes, yes, it would. Yes, sir. So we, we posted uh, to, our, to our list, we posted the website and sent out the, the email blast to about 300 folks. We got seven, seven written comments. I think a couple of these are actually from the same, same person. But one of the, the first one that we had, and we talked to the planning commission about this one, they supported the amendment, but they suggested we reduce the cottage home maximum size. It was originally 2,000 square feet. Um, we did that at Planning Commission. We took it down to 1,500. They, uh, one person um, uh, says the increase in density would help defray some of the costs in, in developing the tiny home community. Uh, another person mentioned special rules for senior homes and, and crime issues, but then in the email they said, I don't know how to address it. But that was just, just a comment they made. Um, one person said these are an attractive option for an older population and for folks coming into town giving an increase in manufacturing jobs. Um, one person asked about the amendment, whether garages would be permissible. The answer is yes. We've been silent on garages in our amendment. They obviously cannot be as big as the tiny home because accessory structures have to be smaller than the principal living, living dwelling. Um, one person suggested reducing the minimum lot frontage for the parent parcel from 50 feet to 40 feet and allowing, allowing them in C1 to, to allow live work opportunities. Uh, my response to that one is reducing it to 40 feet. You're, you've got 20 feet for, a, for, for your driveway coming in. You've got eight feet on each side for your buffer. I think that only leaves 14 feet to be able to put the garbage cans in and be able to put the sign in. So. I think we should stick with the 50 feet, and that's what I mentioned to this person. Um, C1, all, C1 allows live work opportunities anyway, upper story units above commercial. Uh, one person made a comment uh, about a concern when a development is built and a public hearing is not required. So they, 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 didn't, they didn't say they were opposed to the amendment, they just voiced that as, as something that we should, we should be cognizant of. So this is the statement of reasonableness and consistency as, as recommended by Planning Commission. They, they found it consistent with the 2030 land use plan uh, relative to policies about affordable housing and infill development. And they uh, unanimously recommended referral to you. And these would be your, your next steps if you wish to adopt the new amendment. All right, questions? Brian? Uh, I'm not, I'm just going to call you tomorrow. Uh, I've got a lot okay. of, I, I I'm not going to do this. Yet. Yeah, that, that'll work. I, I just that'll work. think that's better for me because I really just need to, but I think that um, one, one quick question though, what, why did we, a lot of times I like to know why we did what we did when we did it and what, you know, like so that we're not reversing something, but the 20 feet as opposed to the 10, why would we have done 20 feet in the first place? That has, you, you mean for the multifamily yeah. spacing? That has been in the code probably since we adopted it in, in 2000 and it has never been changed. And, and I don't know why it was done initially mm -hmm. that way. Um, it, it probably because most multifamily developments are two, two three stories and you, and you get them 10 feet apart, that's just a little too close. And, and I think probably at the time it was written, no one envisioned. But you can designate if it's a one story. Right, then, exactly. But so we're not recommending that three stories be. Right, it's just, just, a, just, just the, the one, one story. story units, yes sir. Okay, what about one of those cottages then that are two story cottages? They would, they would still have to be 20 feet apart. Okay. And in multifamily project. Last year, Terry and I went to a workshop at the City Vision at Wilmington and they had implemented things similar to this and were very excited dealing with infill, dealing with affordable housing. They said in Wilmington, if they didn't have this, they wouldn't have any new housing. So anyway, they were just really pushing that this was a really good thing. So I, I like this very much. Yeah, at, at the National League in Kansas City, I went to visit a, a veterans tiny home community. 
And in that case, they were using about the same here, except for the fact that they allowed to go up to five acres, up to 49 units. Again, the same amount of units, but the project itself for veterans was very, very strong. Jennifer? So Kevin, just to, I think I know the answer to this, but just to clarify, this is just for um, what would be considered a development, correct? This would not be on my three acres that I own, I can put a towny, tiny house back on that piece of property, correct? That that still stands in the ordinance from correct. a perspective, because I know we've had a lot of inquiries about the axillary dwellings as well. If you want to put up to, if you want to put four or more, this would apply. But gotcha. Four, four a and it would have to be subdivided though, is that correct? Like if I had three, so I could put a, four tiny houses back there for all of my kids and build a little, no, I'm not going to do this right. clearly. <laughs> and I wouldn't suggest anybody in this room doing it. Um, however, that would be an option as my question is if I wanted to put four of those dwellings back there, as long as I had the appreciate spacing and all of that good right, stuff, then it would be, and you make those limitations. Yeah. Okay. In your zoned RC or RV. Okay. Um, and, and one of the questions someone asked, well, how much of the city will be opened up for, for development? And, and I looked at the percentages of their zoning. We have, RV zoning consists of 7.3% of our land area. RC is 8.4%. And that doesn't include the lots that are over 10,000 square feet or 15,000 square feet. And a lot of those are, and it excludes the conditional district versions and it also excludes any new subdivisions, which probably wouldn't, you wouldn't have these in there anyway. So it would be a lower percentage than, I'm not sure how much lower, but lower than seven or eight percent. And then one final question, this would not allow me to, if I had one piece of property to put one tiny home on that property, or would it, I guess is my question. It would, and you could do that now. I okay. Mean, if you have if you have a single lot, it's just normal building standards. And, and just change no, this normal building code. If you yeah. want to build a six hundred square foot house, as long as you have that kitchen, that living room, that bedroom that meets state building code, there's no there's no limitation on how small your house can be as long as you meet building code. Very good. Thank you. And, and how do we pick R, V, and R, C? Those are our higher density um, um, zoning districts. R, R, V is a units an acre or RC is 15 under normal circumstances. May I? May I? Is, there is there a way that, I know you guys have a lot of nice mapping tools, but um, it, it, would it be too cluttered if you were to send us maybe tomorrow, if, if it's easy to, to like key that on a, on a map you know, maybe in this area where I can see what, what is that RV and RC? I can, I'm a little That's bit ahead. right there, right? I'm a little bit ahead of you. Okay, good. Um, for once. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there it is. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, these are, the, these are the vacant lots that are RV and RC that are over 10,000 square feet and up, up to two acres. Um, and also the lots that are with, with, with mobile mm -hmm. homes that would be easy to, redevelop those so but so so following up on Jennifer's question though is like if you lived in a neighborhood that that is part of that well I've got two questions if, if it's part of that that zoning if I'm living in a, a neighborhood with with some nice lots somebody could come and do a tear down and do this right so it just changes the character if, of my neighborhood. If they were, if they were zoned for it, correct. Secondarily, is there a way to create a, a separate zoning altogether so that we could just zone it a tiny lot, lot um, so that we have a little more control over that if there's a big, I, I just, I need to think about this a lot. Sure. More. Um, and and, and that would, questions to this. you know, you can have overlays for, for everything and make them the site plan control zoning. So there is possibility to kind of create another zoning district if we wanted to Certainly. sort of it would, it would add steps, it would add, it would add costs. It would add costs, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I, 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 I like these. I just think, I just want to think of all the unintended consequences, you know, like I've seen these all over the place and I think they're cool and they address a lot of needs, but I also know that we saw the shiny side of it, you know, in a lot of these pictures. 
there's also some bad sides to it. And, and I just, I need to think about it a little bit. And, and I want to talk to you about it tomorrow. Kevin, if, yeah. just real quick. I mean, speaking of what you're saying, I mean, what are the, on a square foot cost build out, you're probably looking at $200,000 on these little guys, right? I know the one from Atlanta that we saw, they, they were selling right. for, for 210000 That okay. was That was the smaller unit. That was the 600 square yeah. footer? Right. Yeah, you got to be in some pretty good neighborhood price wise. Pricing, I should say, even. So, you know, if you're killing infill. Well, you have an HOA overlay. I mean, you would have an HOA overlay if it's in a rural park or something that you're not going to be able to. And, 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 that, and that's one thing they have to have the I'm common sorry. area. They either have to be, if they're not subdivided, they would be under ownership of an entity that right. would take care of common areas. If they are subdivided, you have to have cross access easements and planted common area, which would be. Have to be governed by, by someone, you know, a small covenant, four person, four to fifteen person HOA. Yeah, but, that's different on my side of town. There's a lot there. There aren't any HOAs, so it's a whole different ball game. So I just, I just. You know. Does the structure have to be a permanent foundation? Yes, yes, okay. they have to. It, the definition actually calls tiny homes out as being on a permanent foundation. So you couldn't wheel in a tiny home and say zip. That would be an RV park, which we allow under outdoor recreation, which would be a commercial zoning district, and typically right. other jurisdictions allow them on, on, on wheels, and, and, and they tend. But we want, we want I mean, I mean, they're so new, they're so new. A lot of jurisdictions haven't right. really figured out whether that's good or bad or not right. at this point. But we we decided to start with a permanent foundation. JC, uh, see if you're ahead of me. Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> These red dots. That those are that's open potential lots that fit the parcels that fit the zoning. Correct between ten RV and RC zone parcels between ten thousand square feet. So just in two acres. Do, do you know if if we hit the maximum density, how many tiny homes could we build on all these red dots? Two hundred eighty-four. No, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not that far ahead of you. Yeah. Just wondered how, how much are we really opening up? It, it, it looks like a little bit. That we're opening up. I was just curious. Yeah, I can. I can probably find that out fairly. So, the second question: the densities did seem a little small to me. I mean, it was almost you're hitting the maximum lot that you gave them. Do those densities match up with these other municipalities that you contacted? They they, they do. They do. Um, and, and and a lot of jurisdictions just allow the base zoning to govern and don't give any type of density bonuses whatsoever. Raleigh allows up to, uh, I think up to 30 units on a tiny home, in a tiny home development, but they allow the parent parcel to be as small as 3,000 square feet. But they have this really complex system of, of how you meet infill criteria, and you have to meet about 30 different rules to be able to put one in. Um, but it's, it, what, we've, what we're doing is pretty, pretty common. I, just, I honestly think this is a product that we need desperately. Uh, I was just wondering how much product can we really get at maximum, uh, some idea. Uh, I, can, I can find that out. Second question, completely com completely off the third question, completely off the thing. Do we allow what I call a Connex, a storage box? Can that be converted into housing? As long as it meets state building code. It, okay. they would have to be retrofitted and okay. upgraded. Any more questions? And, and, just, and just to clarify, those red dots are only on open land. The red, there's, a, there's a lot of other places where you could do teardowns can, in the center can, city. So you just tear down. So those are, those represent open land and manufactured homes. So if you see up the, the country acres development up in the upper left hand corner, those are, mm -hmm. those are essentially mobile homes that, that, that we. But any of these RCRV is eligible for this? Correct. Can you send me a map of that tomorrow? Sure. Okay. Thank you. you. You mean everything above? Everything that's that you can put one of these on. From 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 ten thousand feet to two acres. Yeah. Which which is that? Is that hard? But those are open spaces, not tear down. You're you're talking everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's Every, it's a lot. Sure, right? sure. Yeah. Yeah. So is is that when you said seven point three two percent and and eight point three percent on the RC? Yes. That's 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 the map you want. That's just open space, or is that everything? He, he's, he's wanting he's wanting every 
RV and RC parcel between 10,000 square feet and two. If, if it, I mean, I don't want you to sit there. Like, if it's yeah. something you can hit a couple little buttons and send it out, like, I don't want you to. I think it's, I think it's fairly easy. I okay. mean, this, I think this one only took like. I just want to see it. 15 minutes for a GIS guy to do. Like, it wasn't that, that and difficult. Uh, for all, probably a day and a half for you. But if I, but if it's, you can do it on GIS, I can do it. <laughs> we, we have it. You can, I don't even know how to use the filters. All right. Any more questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Item number three, conduct a public hearing in case Z, CD 2022. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Steve's going to cover this item for council this evening. Okay. Mayor, members of council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kochinski, Ms. Deason. This is a rezoning uh, from the applicant is Niblock Homes, and the address is 2601 Eva Drive. This was considered by the Planning Commission last month and they recommended approval for council and it's coming to council because it requires a land use plan change and the planning commission does not have that authority. So they did vote unanimously for the reason for to recommend the rezoning and the land use plan change. Summary, it's an expansion of the Cumberland subdivision. They're adding 24 units and about seven and a half acres. And the RC zoning of the existing Cumberland that will be expanded is not consistent with the land use plan. So I'm gonna skip over real quick. So when I show you the existing conditions, you've got the main entrance off EVA and you've got the second entrance off EVA. This is the existing site plan that's approved. So now I'll go back. So there's your main entrance coming in off EVA and this is existing conditions. This is going down, that's Kingsley on EVA. This is that second entrance that was permitted to start with. You just can't see it from the trees. That's where the expansion would occur and would occur on both sides of the second entrance. And the same thing here, you can see that entrance and there's the expansion. Whoops, okay. You're exactly right. Yep. And then this one, there's the expansion, and then there's the entrance. And then this is Eva looking south, so there's the entrance, and it's right here. So it kind of gives you a good orientation. Uh, George did. Uh, George is our drone pilot. Yes, they're extremely handy. So this is the proposed site plan and in the red, it shows the expansion on both sides of that second entrance and then this area for the seven and a half acres. Okay, this just highlights the area. So this just compares to existing with the expansion, got 41 acres to 41 acres, 120, 144. The units per acre is almost identical. The open space increases, the amount of active goes down a little bit, and that's because they're active. Open space is in the main part. The percent open space goes up, and the average lot size stays the same, and a typical lot size stays the same. We put this in because whenever it was approved to start with, the amenity center was pretty conceptional. It's, it's better defined now. It just shows the amenity center. We're also including pickleball courts and something else I want to mention. It is age restricted and the new part will also be age restricted by deed. So typical lot dimensions of lots one through 20 and then typical lot dimensions 121 through 144, the side setback is the only change. It actually increases with the, the next phase. The Cumberland elevation stay the same. And then the surrounding zoning, and there's the lot that you were asking about, Ms. McKenzie. And the, the zoning, the surrounding zoning, is it, it's a hodgepodge of of the RCCD, the RM2, a little bit of C2, and office. 
OI office institutional. Is this developer aware of that rezoning on the yes. lot next to him? Yes, sir. They were at the same meeting. Okay. Yep. Uh, so the land use plan. In summary, with the commercial, this is the designated commercial. You look over the table, there's no RC. So that's why it requires the amendment. Then you go to suburban neighborhood. That's this area. Go to the table, no RC. So it would require the land use change to urban neighborhood, which includes the RC. And there are 12 recommended conditions that Planning Commission also accepted. Uh, this is more technical. And then you would have three steps, statement of consistency, zoning map approval, and then the recommendation on the land use plan. And I'll actually add a line for Thursday night, I thought about this a second ago, on the land use plan to say from commercial and suburban neighborhood to, to urban neighborhood. That way it'll be very clear for your vote. And we have the suggested statement of consistency ready for you Thursday night, if you so choose. And that's it. Any questions, Council? And there was no opposition. Here, no, sir. Okay. Ma'am? Could you go back to those 12 conditions, please? Sure. Okay. May I ask a question as to, I know that second entrance has always been there. There wasn't anything. Is part of the reason because both of those pieces of property were acquired and then were taken in? Like, can you talk to me a little bit about the, the, um, like when you look at that second entrance, there's there's where the houses are going to be yeah. going on the sides. Right. Those weren't in the original plan they, because this property wasn't part of that acquisition, nor was that back property. Correct. correct. Okay. Right. Yeah. So uh, my second question is: We have approved sewer for the expansion. The expansion. Yes, yes ma'am. The twenty-four lots. Which does include these twenty-four. It does. Yes, okay. ma'am. Very good. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other question from council. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now item four. Conduct public hearing for case Z twenty four twenty two, consider adopting an ordinance amending official zoning map. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this item, uh, in talking with staff, there has been a request to table this item or continue it to the April meeting. So it was already on the agenda and advertised. So if council so desires to do that we would not have to re-advertise the meeting for April. So is there a, what do, 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 do you want to do it today, correct? You can do it today or you can do it either Thursday, either one. There's a motion to move. Hey, we'll the motion second, ready to vote. All in favor, raise your hand. So we have moved this to the April meeting, okay. Thank you very much. Moving to petitions and requests. <clears throat> Number one, consider approving a new benefit rate plan for the City of Concord fiscal year 24. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Chantel is going to come forward along with uh, a rep from uh, Gallagher, our broker, uh, to talk about the recommendations to council for the coming fiscal year. Chantel. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kolchinski, and Mrs. Deason. I'm here today along with the representative from our broker, Gallagher, to present the FY24 benefits recommendation. I will turn this portion of the presentation over to Dominique Palmer. She's our representative from Gallagher, and she will discuss the recommendations for medical, dental, as well as other benefits. Once she has covered this information, I will discuss the recommendation for a new leave benefit for coworkers. Thank you. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, members of council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kojinski, and Mrs. Deason. The city continues to offer choice to coworkers by offering three medical plans. We are recommending that we maintain the benefits as are offered today. And due to favorable plan performance, we're recommending no change to the budget and no change to coworker contributions. The exhibit that's being shown shows the um, trend that's included in our projections as we did the modeling for the new plan year. Additionally, we want to provide an update on dental. We are in a rate guarantee, so there is no change to the cost to the city. 
we will maintain that $10 semi-monthly dental incentive for coworkers that have one preventive visit during calendar year 2022. Moving on to other benefits. So as we approached the strategic conversations about benefits in the fall, Chantelle and her team wanted to poll the coworkers and understand their motivations for benefits, what they valued as we looked at what we had today and whether there were opportunities to introduce new benefits. Based on the survey responses, we're happy to report that we will be introducing or recommending that we introduce a discount auto and home insurance that's set up as a marketplace where our coworkers can go in, they can enroll at any time, and it's no cost to the city. Additionally, we will be introducing identity theft coverage, which is employee pay all or coworkers, if they elect the coverage, they are able to cover the full cost so there's no cost to the city. And then also rolling out a financial planning and budgeting tool called Gallagher Money Coaching that really elevates the tools and resources available to coworkers. These were the top three items based on survey responses. Gallagher is waiving the cost of the program to the city, so coworkers will have access to web-based um, tools. They'll also interact with coaches to really help them through all facets of their life in terms of financial planning and budgeting. Any questions before I turn this over to Chantel? Any question, Council? Yes. Okay, so identity theft coverage, will the coworkers be automatically enrolled in that or they will have to go out and enroll? They will have to go and make an election. So it will be offered during open enrollment. Is it for a year? I mean, how long does the identity theft yes. coverage for a year? All right, and lastly, this just captures the coworker and the city contributions, which are unchanged. All right. Thank you very much. So we have a new benefit, uh, excuse me, a new lead benefit recommendation for this year based on the feedback from our benefit survey. Um, a number of employees requested that the city offer paid parental bonding leave. Um, therefore, HR is recommending that the city provide up to six weeks of paid paternal bonding leave to eligible coworkers who are becoming parents or expanding their families and need continuous paid leave away from work to bond with their new child or just to their new family situation. Paid Paternal bonding leave, excuse me, paid paternal bonding leave would enable the coworker to take paid time away from work to care for and bond with a newborn or a newly adopted or newly placed child under the age of 18. This leave would run concurrently with the FMLA leave and paid paternal bonding leave would be in effect for births, adoptions, foster care placement or legal placement and local parentis placement occurring on or after July 1st, 2023. This well, leave benefit would be at no additional cost to the city as salaries are already included in the approved budget. If this benefit recommendation is approved by city council, the paid paternal bonding leave policy will come to city council for consideration in the April council meeting. At this time, I'll take any questions regarding this leave. Questions? Yes, sir. Hey. Um, what, what do we do now? I thought we always provided some family medical leave, or is it, what, what are we doing now? So FMLA is a uh, job protection and is not paid. So when a coworker is out of work on FMLA, they must use their accrued time. So that's sick leave, vacation time, or comp time if they have it to pay themselves during that time. Um, after they are out of work for a certain period of time, short-term disability can kick in at that time. So when some so when a mother has a child, generally the short-term medical benefit does kick in. So do we coordinate those benefits? So in other words, if they receive the short-term disability benefit, do we reduce the amount that we pay, or do they get double that? It's not. You can't double dip. So then so they would honor the short-term. 
short-term disability will not kick in until the city has paid out all monies through whatever leave we have available. So leave okay. has to be exhausted, meaning they cannot be compensated by the city if they're collecting short-term disability. And we do coordinate benefits. Gotcha. So, so how does it not cost us anything? Because the city's uh, budget already accounts for salary. So whether we're here or not, you've already budgeted, the city has already budgeted for our salaries. I don't have a question, just a comment. I think this is a very uh, good policy for um, our employees. Um, and I'm pleased to see that it covers different categories of parent being a parent or becoming a parent um, and not just by natural birth or, or anything like that. So uh, it's a good job to you and your staff for pulling this policy together. Thank you. Other comments? Okay. Chantel, thank you very much for the work you guys have been doing on this. Good job. All right, item two, consider authorizing city manager to negotiate and execute a contract amendment, uh, addendum number two, Tiber Wright Ellington. Thank yes. you, Mr. Mayor. Dirk will cover this item for council. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of council, Ms. Pol Ms. Kolchinski, Mr. Payne, and Ms. Ms. Deason. This is a request uh, regarding addendum to number two for Talbot Bright Ellington's uh, design for their fuel farm expansion includes uh, adding additional uh, lighting, also additional pump for redundancy, easy switchover catwalks for a number of tanks that we don't have currently, widening the pavement for a wider gate and replacing the gate. Uh, current um, increase is $38,079.00. Uh, the total amount for both addendum number one and two uh, would equal $55,111, which is $5,111 exceeding the city mayor's authorization. Okay. Questions? Uh, there will be partly our retained earnings, internal cash. Okay, other questions? All right. Thank you, Durham. Thank you. Number four, consider abandoning construction easement. Oh, number three. Number three, sorry. Consider awarding a bid for five million nine hundred forty-five thousand seventy-five construction of the ten hundred KV line. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Alex is going to cover this item for uh, council this evening. Good evening, Mayor, members of council, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kojinski, Ms. Deason. On February 16th, the electric staff received bids for the construction of the 100 KV transmission tie line between the new substation T on Highway 29 beside Christie's Nursery and the new delivery floor behind Ben Monette Chevrolet at the grounds of Concord. This, includes, this construction includes 68 poles total with 29 of those requiring concrete foundations. These poles will run along Highway 29 in front of Eli Lilly and then cross the grounds going back to our new delivery floor. This transmission line is also the, new, the line that will feed the new Lilly substation from. We received five bids and Power Grids was the low bidder in the amount of $5,945,000 $75.10. Power Grid was also the contractor on the first phase of this project and had great success and did us a very good job. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from council? JC? It's my tip. <laughs> 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 yes, sir. We, we, we laughed at that as well. Sir? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Now, number four, consider abandoning a construction easement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sue will cover this item for council. Uh, Mayor, council members, Mr. Payne, Ms. Kolchinski. Ms. Kolchinski. Um, this request is to remove a construction easement off um, 388 Camden Street. Um, this is an old easement, um, an old deed back from 1984, has a permanent easement and it has a um, construction easement. And the construction easement, the, the purchaser of this property, their attorney has suggested um, that they have it removed. Typically now in our language, we, we make a point to say temporary construction easement, so it's, it's automatically known, but this did not have the word temporary in front of it. All right, any questions? All right, thank you very much. Anyone, uh, do, do you have consent agenda? Want to remove anything from consent agenda? All right, nothing to. Anything else to discuss today before we go into closed session? All right, need a motion to move into closed session pursuant of NC General Statute 143-318-11A-3 in order to consult with an attorney and give instruction concerning judicial action titled Larson versus City of Concord. Is there a motion? So moved, Mayor. Second. 
Motion second. All in favor, raise your hand. All right. Thank you very much. Everybody have a good evening, and we'll see you back here Thursday.